we've been going through this series of, of Welcome Home and um, talked about father and mother and sister and brother and we hit on I think enough that families aren't perfect and our families aren't perfect but the point is my point is about this series that we've been going through is that God through the family system and through the relationships that we have especially that are good through the emotions that we feel about family is showing us about his relationship with us that he he is a father he is a mother he's a sister and a brother to us and he wants to welcome us home he wants to welcome us into his family so he started off four weeks ago with this video I'm gonna show it another time okay and for some of it's just kind of an emotional video so um, let's just go through I think it's two or three minutes and it just shows some scenes of people coming home so God is trying to create a home for us a place where we feel that we're always welcome where they open up the door for us and they always want to see us regardless of what's happened in life uh, regardless how many years we've been gone and that's that's the picture that that God wants us to have not just of earthly families but of the family of God well we've talked about uh, God as a father and a mother and as a sibling today we're going to talk about God as a household and the first question we start talking about families or a household is What's a family? And, and, you know, right now in our culture, this is kind of up in the air. How do you define family? Everybody's got kind of a different explanation or, you know, of, of what a family could be. And, of course, we have the traditional family with a, with a birth mother and a birth father and two and a quarter children now, you know, living in the same home and, and they, they're there every night. And that's the traditional family. And, of course, that model is there are fewer and fewer of those models. Then we have things like adoptive families, where, where um, you know, somebody ad adopts a child, and you're seeing that more and more in, in our world. Um, we're seeing blended families. We know blended families and step families. We have cohabitating families, where, where people don't get married, but they have children together and for a season perhaps live together or not. Uh, we have what's emerging as a com commuter families, where where maybe one or more, uh, one of, at least one of the parents is gone, uh, maybe out of town all week and comes home every the weekend, or you know because of the economy can't get a job here in town. We we have foster or group home families, kind of family for a season, you know, and uh, compose that. And now we have uh, gay and lesbian families. Uh, we have grandparent-led families, and we have, of course, single parent led families. Those are just a few of the examples. I'm sure there's some others that I've uh, omitted and not, not thought of, but I don't want to enter into that today. I bring that up just to get it out of the way, because that's not what where I want to go. I mean, I, I, it, to, to me, okay, if, if you've got two guys that want to adopt a child, I, I might, you know, maybe i got some problems with that, but at least they want to be a family. You know, that's something very positive there that they, they want to be a family. Or if you've got four or five twenty somethings that live together and share resources and they say, We're a family, you know, right now. Well, at least they want to be a family. At least they're seeing the need to be with some other people and to go through life with some other people. You know, people have in our culture right now, something's going on that's never really happened before in the world. People have for some time said, we don't want anybody. We just want to be alone. Just just leave me alone. I mean, I, I don't want anybody. I don't want family. I, I, I want to eat by myself. I want to sleep by myself most of the time. You know, I want to be left alone. I don't want anybody in my business. I don't want anybody poking around on me. Uh, I, I want to be able to move from city to city as I want to. I don't like holidays. I hate turkey. I don't want to buy Christmas presents for anybody. Just leave me out of all that mess. I just want to be an individual going through life completely by myself. And, you know, when the day comes that I die, just burn me up and do something with the ashes because I don't want uh, any kind of service. I don't want anybody knowing anything about me. I just want to be alone. My family... Well, I guess if you have to call it a family, you know, it's my, my pets or my celebrities, 
uh, my sports team, they're all kind of in my family, you know, maybe my music, that kind of composes what I would consider my family. Um, and those people, I mean, they're all, we're really tight, um, you know, they, they don't judge me, there's no expectations, I'm free, and I'm alone. And this has never happened before in the history of the world to this extreme, where uh, in no other culture has individuality been placed such a high value as what we're placing right now in our Western culture. And all the other cultures before, one's wealth and one's success has been determined by the size of your tribe or your clan, how many people, how many Facebook friends you have, how many people you're related to, see. And the people that had the larger tribes were more powerful, more successful, thought to be, you know, we want to be like them. And now it's just kind of flipping, flipped around in our culture where the person who doesn't need anybody, who's completely individualistic, oh, now they become the ideal. This, this has never happened before. Years back in what I would call Boomerville or um, Boomer time, uh, there was a, a hit song by Three Dog Night. Uh, they said, um, one is the loneliest number that you'll ever know. Remember that, some of you old boomers. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever know. Two can be as sad as one. You know, it goes on to sing that. Maybe we need to bring that song back. Strangely, people who want to be alone congregate in crowds. This, this is what's really odd about this. Most of them don't drop off the grid and go out into the woods and live in a bus someplace. Most of them move into the cities where there's a whole lot of people who are alone and they can be nameless and anonymous with thousands of people together. If you get enough people together, no one knows anyone. Everyone's a stranger. And, and even in our churches, this is becoming what is the new acceptable norm is that nobody knows me here. This is kind of shocking, but I checked these statistics out. Uh, not personally. Um, I, I couldn't actually do the poll myself, but I checked a number of places, so I got it off the Internet. Trust me, this is, this is valid stuff. 90% of Americans attend a church of 400 people or more. You guys are just weirdos. 90% attend a church of 400 people or more. The average size of the church in America is a little, just a little bit over 70. About 75 people is the average size. So it means that we've got a whole lot of small churches with a bunch of weird people like you that go over Sunday. But 90% of Christians today are going to go to a church of 400 people or more where probably they're going to know a few people, but the chances of them really being known there are lessened, obviously, and most of us kind of like that. We, we don't want anybody getting in our business. We don't want anybody, you know, insinuating or asking that we might want to do something. Uh, alone is very popular. Uh, Christians often become fans and admirers of others uh, who are on mission. We cheer for them. We... we we are their fans. We like them on Facebook. We read their blogs. We might even give them a little bit of money. But all we do is we just know their names. We really don't have a relationship with us. But one person, listen, one person alone does not represent Jesus Christ. One person alone does not represent Jesus Christ. God works through households, through community, through groups, extended families who often don't have any kind of genetic uh, connection with someone else, but they have closer relationships as brothers and sisters than sometimes blood brothers and sisters have. Now, in the Bible, the, the Greek word for household is oikos. Uh, I'm not trying to impress you, but you can throw this around at the, you know, at the water fountain. Um, you know, well, I, you know, our whole oikos was together yesterday. And uh, we had, everybody was there, and people will think that you're really quite the scholar, and you can impress them. But you know, just just trying to broaden us out a little bit. But um, this takes me back to a time uh, where there were real households um, in the New Testament. People lived in cluster housing, 
So if if you you know got married, you just added on another room or two kind of to the family cluster. And you might have aunts and uncles that are there and grandma and grandpa might be there. But families were much larger in biblical times and they did kind of live in clusters or households, not just a single nuclear family with a few children, no matter how that's composed. But but there would be a lot of people together and it was called oikos, the household. It, It might include people who are mainly blood relatives, but also some who were not blood relatives that had had need or, or somehow found some affinity with these people and would join in their household. But it is where you found your identity. This is, this is what your purpose was. That was the group that always had to, as our video said, always had to welcome you home. They always had that sign out for you. And oikos was in God's plan and method for reaching the world. That's how he was going to do it. How do I know that? Well, first of all, this is how Jesus did it. Jesus used households to reach the world. You know, we're great at looking at the words of Jesus and the works, how, you know, his miracles and stuff, but the way of Jesus, how he went about ministry, is really worth paying attention to. And the way that he went about ministry, the way he formed his action team, was through a household. So Jesus formed this new household, a new family that was composed of his followers. And with that new household, he set out to change the world. So, you know, Jesus didn't go, well, I need to get some financial backing. I need to find a big synagogue to back me. I need to get my 501c3, right? We need to get our logo done, get some media around us, get something viral going, you know, so when I launch my mission on the world... No, he just got some guys, chose, hand chose some very different kind of guys from each other to to be together into a community. It's very organic. Now, there's a passage in Scripture uh, in Mark, the book of Mark, that when you read it, it's really quite shocking if you consider everything. In his day, it, it was radical and unthinkable how Jesus did this, and you know, this is one of those passages of Scripture. You might read this, and if you don't understand things, you might think, well, Jesus was really being kind of mean that day. And and really, uh, you know, maybe they should have left that out of this whole thing. But he's up at Capernaum around the Sea of Galilee, and we know that he's healing and he's performing many miracles and it's extreme success. And it says the whole world is coming to him from all over. People are just streaming into Capernaum. And they're bringing their sick and their demon possessed to him. And he's healing them all. And the word is spreading like crazy. And he chooses his 12 disciples. And everything is going great except for one area. And his family is the problem. Um, His mother, uh, no mention of Joseph at this time, his stepfather, and his brothers thought that he had gone crazy. Literally, they thought he was nuts. And he was saying things like, I forgive your sins. And they were going, wait a minute, you forgive our sins, only God can forgive your sins. He's going, yeah, right. And so his, his mom and his brothers, they said, well, you know, we, we need to go get him. And he had kind of gotten run out of his hometown of Nazareth there when he said some things that they didn't like. And so at this point, we think that he's, his new household, his home, is Peter's home, which is there in Capernaum, right there on the Sea of Galilee. And so here we are, Mark 3, 20 to 21. It says, Then he, that's Jesus, went home. And we think this means to Capernaum, to Peter's house. And the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He's out of his mind. Other translations will say he's lost his mind. It actually is a very technical term. It doesn't mean he's acting illogically. It means that he has got a mental disorder. In our vernacular, we'd say it that way. Out of, out of his mind, crazy. So who does he think he is? Does he think he's God? And we better get him home, give him some rest. He's obviously stressed, you know. Give him some time here at home with mom and the boys, and then, you know, we can, we can regroup. But Jesus won't go because things have changed. It isn't that he doesn't like his family, but he's just redefining family for everyone else. So we go on, Mark 3, 31 to 35. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they, they sent 
to him and called him, and a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my brother who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. It's interesting that none of the gospel writers report any kind of response from the mother and the brothers. You can just imagine how they might have felt about this. But you see, Jesus isn't about just pleasing them. He's doing something much greater than a nuclear family, something much much bigger than that. The household, the oikos, and, you know, is is what he uses to be the instrument for him to carry the gospel. Jesus had two kinds of brothers and sisters. He had blood brothers and sisters, half brothers and sisters, actually, and he had faith brothers and sisters. And his brother James, who at this time is probably in this group, doesn't even believe in Jesus, isn't even a follower, after the resurrection, it says Jesus appears to him, and then, G- then James becomes a leader in the church, but this time they don't even believe that he's the Messiah. So what he is teaching them is that the household of faith, the family of faith, is greater than the family of blood. Some of the most difficult things that Jesus said were in reference to family. I thought of Luke twelve fifty one to 53. Um, set in context, this Jesus is talking here about a period of time close to his return. He says, Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. There will be divided father against son and son against father, and mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. We say, wow, you must have been at our house at Christmas, you know, kind of looks how things kind of flow sometimes around the family at some of our events, you know, we got two in one room talking about the other three, they're in the other room, and you know, this is just one example where Jesus points out to us that that he is doing something greater than the human family. And the human family is not immune, okay, from division. And some of that is going to come about because of him. You see, it may be that not everybody in your family believes that he is the one. So there's going to be some division. But he established a new household, Oikos. And the way that Jesus did things was how his disciples did things as well. His way was their way. I mean, that's that's only natural. He formed new households, new families composed of people on mission together who would go anywhere, would do anything to reach their people with the good news. And his followers did the same way. So we see uh, some rather shocking things from these new households. Luke uh, tells us in the book of Acts that although there were now thousands of people right after Pentecost who were believers, they were organized into households. You might miss this, see. Acts 2:42 um, and the verses following says that they were continually devoted to the apostles' teaching, not occasionally, but continually to the, to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, they were eating together, and to prayer. And verse 44 says that they had all things in common. That's, that's not a new system of economic system that they were advocating. It just means that they were dependent upon anybody. If somebody had a need that was a brother or sister in the faith, then they would help. And then we get to Acts 2, 46 to 47. And you've heard this before. It says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They were worshiping together, they were taking their meals together, and it was successful. That's what I want you to hear today. This is successful. God was adding to their number day by day. People were not joining the church because they had a real killer youth program or the band was great. They were coming into this community 
because a new household had been formed. And they were becoming, the, this household was becoming the carrier of the gospel. Okay, The same family system that had been in the Old Testament and the first covenant, remember in the first covenant, it goes through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It was a family system. Now in the new covenant, it's still a family household system. This is the model. So we see things in scripture like the words of Paul to the Ephesians. Ephesians 2.19. He says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. I love that phrase, the household of God, the oikos of God. That's the model of relationship and organization that was used to reach the world. Family on mission was the model. And if you pay attention, you see the missionary work of Paul and others using the same model as Jesus. Um, there in Acts, it's uh, 16th chapter, uh, Paul arrives in Philippi, and he organized a household. Uh, first, Lydia, who was a wealthy businesswoman, she becomes a believer, and her home becomes the seat of the church. It says that she and her entire household is baptized. Now, we think, well, three people? No, probably many, many more than that. Households were large. And then the next part of that story, there's the, a young psychic in town, uh, a young uh, psychic girl, and she is converted, and she joins the household. And then because of that and some problems, and Paul and Silas get thrown into jail, and the jailer gets converted, and it says he and his household get baptized. So when we hear about household, we think, well, four or five people. No, probably 25, 30, 40 people Get, these households were large. Their oikos gets baptized. So this is the church in Philippi, and it's a household church that consisted, just think about, the, here's, here's your launch group. Here, here's your plant group for this new church start. You've got this very wealthy businesswoman, a young psychic, and a jailer. Not exactly the demographic that you're going after, right? Where, where you know... Not exactly normal. But that's the target demographic, uh, this new household that God put together. And the close of the story in Acts 16, we, we see that in Acts 16.40, it says that they are meeting at the house of Lydia. And that's because she's a wealthy businesswoman, and she has a very large house, and that's where the church meets. Not meeting in a church building. They're, they're not meeting at some trendy hipster place. You know, like, do they have hipsters then? They had to have had hipsters then. But they're meeting at the home of a woman. And she is the founding member of this church. This is a different kind of family, see, in their day. And that's just one example. In every instance where it's mentioned, the method of reaching people is done through the household. Entire households come to faith. They, they met in clusters of homes that made up a household, and, and that was the form of the church for at least 200 years, is it advanced through households. And with that model and method of church, half of the Roman Empire was converted to Christianity. No great organization, no institution, households, people living out their faith together, people joining into that community. Household by household, brothers and sisters, they knew what it was to be in a family, to share life together. So when they accepted Jesus as their older brother, they naturally knew how to live together into this new household. So some will say, well, thanks for the history lesson, Don, but who's asking, you know, what, what good is this going to do to me? What? Here's, I've got two questions for us today. What if your church became a family on mission? What if we functioned like a family on mission? I mean, we've got a great opportunity, not just us, but, but all Christians today have a great opportunity to reorganize and rebuild our culture by rebuilding extended families, by, by not allowing individuality to become the norm in our lives, but to pull other people together into community and households, oikos, okay? 
This is rediscovering the method that God had from the very beginning, and it's still his primary method of advancing the gospel is person by person, household by household. For that to happen, some things have to change. I'm just going to list a couple. Uh, this isn't just about our church. It's about all churches like this. But for that to happen, the church has to become a place where everyone is home. Okay? So this is home to us. We walk in here and we, we don't feel shunned. We don't feel judged. People aren't, you know, whispering about us behind our back. But this has to be that welcome home place. And the second thing that I thought of here was, and, and this, this is really difficult, and this is the preacher telling you what you ought to do without him doing it. Never do something alone in the church that you could do with someone else. Stop and think about that. What if our model was, was that, oh, I need to do this for church. I need to call someone else up to do this with me. Wouldn't that increase the, the relationships in the family? Instead, we naturally go to, I can do this by myself. I don't need anybody to help me. I can do this by myself. But we, we know we never do anything alone as well as what we do together as someone else. What if that became the kind of the method of operation for a church is that, oh, no, no, no one can clean the church by himself. You have to have someone else clean it with you. I like that, right? No, no, no one else can, can prepare for a class by yourself. You have to be on a team to do it. Now, I know that that's got some problems, but you, but you get the whole idea is that we naturally go to individuality first. I can get this done by myself. And by doing that, we are really de trying to debunk the whole method that Jesus established by, use, by operating in community and operating as a household. Now, my second thing here for us, second question here, is what if your family turned into a household for God? If, if we, as, as Christian Americans, if, if we were asked, what's the mission of your family? Well, what are you working towards? Okay? Depending on what your age is. You know, when you're, you're, you're young and life's going fast and you've got kids that are, you know, you're, you're probably going to say things, I want to make enough money so my child can go to college, right? That's, that's, that becomes pretty, you know, I, I want to make, make the kind of environment, well, we, we need a bigger house or, you know, we, we need some more resources. The, the, the future is a little uncertain for us. What if, what if the mission for our family Okay, the, the mission of your nuclear family was, I want to impact this world for Jesus Christ through my family. I want to leverage my relationships that I have right now that God has given me of brothers and sisters and, and children and, and parents, and I want to leverage that for his good to, to reach the world for Christ. What if I could look at my children and say, these children, okay, can do greater things than what I've done in his kingdom. Is that just too much for us? Is that just too much for us here today? I mean, some of us have brothers and sisters. Well, here in my family, we have brothers and sisters that are double brothers and sisters. I mean, uh, we've got a couple examples in, in this church of sisters that are together and brothers and sisters. You're, you're double brothers and sisters. You're, you're, you're blood brothers and sisters, and you're Jesus' blood brothers and sisters. Wow. That's like squared. That's like taking that relationship and squaring it. It becomes so powerful in his kingdom, okay? Because you know that no matter what else happens, you can't get out of this family, right? You're stuck in this family. You're blood. Okay? So they've always got your back. And I know some of, some, a lot of us have brothers and sisters that are in the faith. And it's, it's strange that when that happens, that, that that's just such a powerful bond. It's squared. It's not doubled. It's squared. It's multiplied against each other. So what if we looked at our families as to be, we're on mission for God? What if the goal of the family, of our nuclear family, was to be on mission for Jesus Christ. I want to just hold that out there for us today. Uh, you may never have thought of that. You, you may never have considered that who God has put together in our family is there for a particular reason. Some of them might still not be double brothers and sisters. It might just be blood brothers and sisters, okay? 
That doesn't mean it's not in his will that they would become blood brothers and sisters. All right. Well, I've enjoyed this. Let's, let's have a prayer, kind of settle in on this as we, as we close in worship. As deep cries out